In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the second gospel was supposed to be the Lord's priestly prayer, but which I marked and disappeared magically. <laughs> Forgive me. Some, many have asked uh, historically about why Jesus revealed himself the way he did. Think of it this way. Jesus easily could have come and he could have stood in the midst of his people and simply said very clearly, listen, here's how it is. I'm God. That's who I am. And every time he healed somebody, he could have healed them and said, that's because I'm God. He could have also said, instead of, wait, wait, record this. I'm talking right now. Write this down. As St. John Chrysostom uh, in his sermons, you know, someone was there always writing. Or he could have even done better and he could have said, don't worry about recording any of this. I've taken notes for you. I'm going to hand it to you. He didn't do, of course, any of that. <clears throat> he came and he preached and he spoke. And it wasn't until almost 30 years after the gospel that much of what we know about Christ is written down. But what we do know from his teaching and much of his teaching, especially when it comes to speaking about the kingdom of heaven, he taught in parables. So not only was he often not clear, and not only was this written down much later, but it was even written down in a way that is very accessible to some and not so accessible to others. And we could ask the question, why? And it is always asked, why did Jesus write in parables or speak in parables? Even his disciples asked this question to him, why do you speak in parables? Now, there are two reasons. We'll go, get to the, the answer he gives his disciples later. But the first reason we have to say is that parables are easily understood stories. They're stories from everyday life that paint a picture, that paint a picture with images of everyday life that make them very accessible to everyone universally. For instance, today when we talk about the sower, we know about farmers, that whether we farmed or not, we can relate to hard soil, soft soil, fertile soil. And so his parable makes sense to the least educated all the way to the most educated. So in that sense, it's very accessible. It's very, if you were to say that Jesus were to teach and he stepped out there and he said, you know, let's talk about the hypostatic union and how I'm consubstantial with the Father, you can almost guarantee that nobody would understand what he was talking about. Nobody would really get it and possibly not certainly remember it 30 years later, although we know that the Holy Spirit brought all to remembrance. Theology can be very abstract. Truth can be very abstract. But when it's packaged in a story, it's very digestible, and we often come to the truths without even realizing that we've encountered a truth being taught. Stories are a way to teach without sometimes consciously teaching. And so Jesus, when he lays out the parables of the kingdom of heaven, is first of all trying to do something that's an immense task. He's trying to explain something that cannot really be fully explained with human words. What the kingdom of heaven is, who Jesus is, how it works, is not something that can be grasped easily and readily understood. And so the closest approximation to giving us understanding is giving us stories, things that we can begin to look at and begin to balance throughout the parables and throughout the teachings of Christ, put them together and come to some sort of mystical sense of direction that Christ provides for us in the gospel. The second reason that Christ teaches in parables, and this gets to the, answers that the answer that the disciples hear, he says that hearing they may not hear and that seeing they may not see. 
This may sound cruel, you know. I have a teaching, but I'm going to teach it to you in a very funny way. And there is a test. And if you fail, it's very bad for you. Maybe the accusation is, why wasn't he clear? But the accusation of, why wasn't he clear, has to be balanced with the understanding that those who were in front of him, that he was teaching, often had no desire to understand what he was saying. They couldn't hear it. They didn't want to hear it. They were willfully ignorant, so to speak. And so by telling them clearly, they would have a greater condemnation. And Jesus says, uh, I believe it was seven times in John, he uses the words, I am. And quite a few of those times, they pick up stones to stone him. When he is clear, the condemnation is greater. Because at least the Pharisees, the scribes, and the Sadducees of that time can claim some sort of ignorance and not fully understanding Christ. But when it's made so plain, and they still respond in a negative way, when they say that he casts out demons by the ruler of the demons, when they stone him when he says, I am, when he says that he has the power to forgive sins, and then they murmur among themselves, these were very clear signs. And their condemnation was much greater because in the face of such clarity, they still rejected him as the Messiah and ultimately, we know, brought him to the cross. So some of this ambiguity, some of the parables are merciful to the scribes and Pharisees. And also we could say that in our own lives and in general, the audience, that not everything should be handed to you. You know, many people would love a, an instruction manual of how to do this Christian thing. How do I love my neighbor? Well, here's 13 points for you, and if you follow each one in order, you will know how to love your neighbor by next week. We would certainly love that sort of process, a little manual that makes it all quick and easy, we don't necessarily have to have responsibility for figuring it out, for thinking for ourselves, for actually suffering or working through the problems that the teachings present, that they would just be laid out for us on a platter and that we could systematically somehow implement them. Now, many of us would love that. I mean, I know at one time I certainly would have liked that. But the question is, do I really want that? It's easy to be an imitator. What's hard is when something is made intimately per uh, uh, personal. When we have to take a teaching and apply it to our lives, it's easy to take the scriptures and say, you're going here, you're going there, and this is good, this is bad. It's different to have it applied to ourselves in the midst of real issues and real suffering and the real things that we go through and to come to the same conclusions or to try to find the gospel commandments within our struggle, that's hard. And so there's another aspect of the parables, which is, is that they require effort. Much like iconography, think about iconography. Today we celebrate the Fathers of the Seventh Ecumenical Council iconography, and you can read in the bulletin, there's some passages from uh, one from St. John of Damascus, but tells you what we believe about iconography. Iconography is easily accessible to you. You can see that that's Jesus and that's Mary and his son on a surface layer. When we go beyond that, there are some things that are hard to read. I'd love you to read the scroll over here. It's just about impossible the, the gospel writings up here are hard to read. They cause you to be drawn into them. You have to strain. When you see the initials in Greek and you see the O on or the Ot on over Jesus' head, unless you've been taught, unless you've asked the questions, you're never going to know that that is a confession of faith. He who is. What the burning bush said to Moses. Our faith ask us to be engaged, to be interested. Even in our iconography, we have to, there's a whole style and an effort of understanding the symbolism behind it. 
And this is the effort that our faith requires. It's one thing in today's parable that our Lord throws seed. We know that he throws seed everywhere. And if you will and are open to it, are looking and are inquisitive about life, there are parables everywhere about the kingdom of heaven. The whole earth is full of thy glory. The whole earth is trying to teach us something about Christ and our God. If we have ears to hear and eyes to see, and most especially in the Bible we know, the Bible is trying to teach us about God if we have ears to hear and eyes to see. Our iconography, our worship, everything is trying to imbue in us the gospel. But we have to want to see it. We are part of being a good soil, a, a good and pure soil that produces fruit is wanting to be a part of it, wanting to understand it. Not always waiting to be spoon-fed. Not always waiting for someone to hand us a list of to-dos and not to-dos. But to actually be engaged in seeking and looking for the mystery which Christ ultimately can reveal to us and does. So there's the paradox of our faith. It is a light yoke to some, it's a heavy yoke to others. It's easy and very comprehensible. The commandments are very clear. And yet in our lives, there's a struggle to understand them and how to apply them. Our Lord speaks clearly to the uneducated with stories. And somehow those who have studied everything and are brilliant cannot understand him. They just don't get it. May we purify our hearts and be open to the idea that God can teach us in anything so that we are ones who have ears to hear and actually hear. And so that with our eyes we can actually see what our Lord is trying to reveal to us, which is always the same. It's the kingdom of heaven. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Christ is in our midst.